Hello! Welcome everyone to a technically funny night. Yes, how's everybody doing? Excellent. We have a great program for you tonight. On our science talk show, we'll be talking to Yon Dr. Jonathan Calderon. Yeah. He'll be telling us about the technology behind PET scans. He's going to tell us how you can see into somebody's mind using antimatter. It'll be fantastic. Afterwards, we're going to have uh, a comedy game called Hot Topics in our comedy lab. And then we'll have three or four of our city's best stand-up comics. It's going to be a great night. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's begin with the science talk show. All right. All right, so welcome to a technically funny science talk show. I'd like to begin by uh, welcoming our, my co-host for the evening, Christopher Drifter. He is a presenter at Barcelona City FM, a wonderful comedian, a beautiful man, and a great human being. So please, you're, you're not supposed to laugh at that. Christopher, your reputation precedes you. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Drifter. Thanks, Matt. I like you, too. How are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling good. And yourself? Really good. good. I think it's going to be a great show tonight. Fantastic. All right. So as a friendly reminder, the show is being recorded to be broadcast worldwide to our millions of listeners at home. For our listeners at home, this, of course, is being taped in front of a live audience of 300,000 naked supermodels. <laughs> Ladies, let's hear it. That's men? right. <laughs> <laughs> and the 150,000 men that came for Christopher Drifter. <laughs> Excellent. All right. You have any shows, anything coming up you want to tell the world about? I don't know. Listen to my show, Midday Coffee. It's at midday, Monday to Friday on Barcelona City FM. That's right. One of the city's best uh, radio programs. The only radio show in English in Barcelona. Yes. And by definition, the best. The best. All right. So let's begin with some science, comedy news. What is it? Comedy news and science. Sounds good to me. Let's do it. Right. You ready? All right. Let's hear. First up, we have an article from Science Magazine that says, quote, glowing mice suggest new gene therapy technique. Holy crap. Glowing mice can talk? <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. Strong that's, joke. That's some terrible copy. Uh, do we have the real article? There it is with the much sexier title of Charge Alternating Releasable Transporters for the Delivery and Release of mRNA in Living Animals. I like how they gave the acronym CARTS so that you could understand what it did. Yes. <laughs> okay. So a group from Stanford University in California believes they have found an especially effective method for delivering genes to live animals. To prove that their novel compound worked, they used it to package uh, the gene that encodes for luciferase, an enzyme that causes bioluminescence in fireflies. They then injected this packaged DNA into a mouse. Luciferous, like Lucifer. This sounds like the devil's work to me, Matt. No devil, just science, baby. Isn't that the same thing? Well, yeah, if you ask any graduate student, they'll tell you that's the same. But. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, back to the mice. So they injected these anesthetized mice with their firefly luciferase. And if their technique they worked, they believed that the mice would glow in the dark. So they did the experiment, and not only did the mice glow in the dark, but they would actually jump up, run around, and uh, be completely unaware of the complex series of events that had just taken place within its body. Fantastic reading there, Matt. Big round of applause for him. <laughs> please, please. Well, at least this will Keep give going. me something else to look at when I'm on drugs and at a rave. That was much better reading, Christopher. <laughs> No, I like this technique because uh, it will make gerbling way, way safer. Hang on, Matt. What's gerbling? Come on, you know gerbling. It's when you put a live rodent up your anus for sexual pleasure. <laughs> Everybody knows that, right? I'd like to take a moment to remind our audience that these are Matt's personal views that I wrote for him in this <laughs> script. And the Technically Funny team does not condone putting live animals into your asshole, whether they happen to be glowing or not. Definitely not more than once, anyway. <laughs> the first time is the best time. Anyway, <laughs> this, 
This isn't the first time the scientists have tried to make glowing mice, of course. The first few attempts using radiation, of course, resulted in some tragic mutant mice and then gave rise to the infamous Mighty Mouse. <laughs> Here he comes to save the day. No, no Mighty Mouse fans, huh? Actually, my dad used to call me Mighty Mouse when I was a kid. Really? I thought he would just call you an asshole. Well, if he had, would you have tried to put a glowing mouse inside of me? I probably would, but only if it felt good. For who? For me, of course. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to our next topic, yeah? What do you got for us, Christopher? All right, a group from Harvard, led by George Church, is trying to resurrect the woolly mammoth. Change slides, Carlos. <laughs> there no. he is. There, no, no. Seamless! We don't have a picture of the woolly mammoth. Okay, we'll imagine it, though. All right. <laughs> All right, this article actually was kind of bullshit. And I know George Church, and I know his work, and he actually, he's a great scientist, but in this article, he just talks out of his ass. So it, what they're actually doing is they're not creating, you know, a resurrected mammoth. They're taking Asian elephant embryos and genetically modifying it so that its genome looks more like the, the mammoth's genome. No, Matt. George Church is going to de-extinct the woolly mammoths within two years. I read it on the BBC. All right. Look, de-extinct is not a word. <laughs> Secondly, I have questions about the ethics of this. So they are trying to modify the, the embryo of Asian elephants, an endangered species. And I think that in order, I think that it's ethically just horrible to, uh, to use endangered species with genetically altered embryos just in order to create what will ultimately be the world's most boring Jurassic Park. <laughs> Matt, George Church promised me on the BBC that he is going to un deadify woolly mammoths and he isn't going to use an endangered species, Matt, because he is going to grow the fetus outside of the womb. All right, yeah, okay. un deadify definitely not a word. What's more, it's called ex vivo, growing a, a fetus outside of a living organism. And this is a technology that is not developed at all. In fact, experts... Uh, that have been asked is suggest that this technology is a decade away at least, right? So that's a lot more than the two years that he was uh, suggesting. But even if we could get living mammoths in two years, what the fuck does he want to do with them? Well, Matt, that's easy. We're going to use the woolly mammoths to solve global warming. Bless his heart. George Church, wonderful scientist again, but... I think this idea is just stupid as hell. And I wouldn't believe that Chris, or that George would actually you know, suggest this, but we have a quote from him that says that the wool of mammoths could in fact prevent global warming and keep tundra permafrost from melting and releasing huge amounts of greenhouse gases. He says, quote, they keep the tundra from thawing by punching through the snow and allowing cold air to come, come in. In the summer, they knock down trees, trees to help the grass grow. Well, that's good, isn't it? How amazing is that? Woolly mammoths are going to prevent the ice from melting in the tundra by destroying it first. And then they're going to knock down the trees, which I imagine are quite pesky for global warming, and replace it with far more efficient greenhouse fighting gas plants like grass. Clearly, mammoths are our one true salvation to end global warming. In other news okay. from this same week, George Church, my friend and close sexual partner, has said that the reversal of aging will be reality within 10 years. And all women over 30 rejoiced. <laughs> Just kidding. No. <laughs> or maybe I wasn't. Because <laughs> all the women are nodding their head. Hmm. No, look, this kind of hyperbole and over an overtalk of uh, scientific achievements is probably the worst thing for science since the Catholic Church. <laughs> Chris, this is depressing the hell out of me. Do you have another story that we can focus on? Because I can't, I can't with this guy. Well, I happen to, yes, Matt, because we wrote this script before the show. <laughs> SpaceX, founded by Elon Musk, is planning to send MRSA, a terrifying antibiotic-resistant bacteria that kills buttloads of people every year into outer space so that it mutates more quickly. 
By bringing MSRA aboard the ISS, scientists hope that the effects of anti-gravity and increased exposure to radiation will speed up its rate of mutation, allowing them to predict how it might evolve here on Earth in the near future. <laughs> And as they describe it in the article, it will be like watching all of the moves your opponent makes in chess before they actually happen. <laughs> what, Matt? This has got to be the dumbest idea I've ever heard. They're going to take the world's most dangerous bacteria, send it up into space so it can mutate rapidly into a more dangerous bacteria. And then they're going to hold that bacteria, the super deadly bug, literally above the heads of the entire world's population. Come on, mate. Come on, it's Elon Musk. He's the world's most adorable billionaire. He's got a name like a perfume. Elon Musk, the new fragrance for men. Oh, no, this is terrible. No, look, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get a sequel to that movie Gravity, you know, with the space station that crashes into the, into the atmosphere. But instead of uh, salvaging the ca acting careers of Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, <laughs> will cause the death of the entire world's population. I don't know, man. I don't, know. I don't think you're being fair. Maybe Elon Musk wasn't trying to send MRSA to the ISS. Maybe he was sending it to ISIS, and he made a simple spelling mistake. <laughs> All right. Now, as ridiculous as that comment is, uh, I think you actually almost have a point. Because the number of times in this article that Elon Musk had to say that he is not, in fact, weaponizing MRSA is incredibly suspicious. This guy sounds literally like a James Bond villain, right? Come on, we've all seen Moonraker, haven't we? No, I haven't seen that. Get some culture. <laughs> all right, well, look, SpaceX is getting too much power anyway. While NASA is crashing space shuttles, into the atmosphere, Elon Musk is elegantly landing rockets upright on their launching pads. Did you see this? It happened, anybody in the audience? Last week, I think it was, they actually landed this rocket on the pad. It was really impressive. I don't know, if you play it in reverse, it's not that impressive. <laughs> I don't know, this whole thing sounds like it has something to do with his Mars colony idea. I think that what he's gonna try to do is just kill off or threaten to kill off as many people on Earth as possible so that everybody wants to move to Mars. Do you think I'm going to be one of the strong humans that Elon Musk invites to Mars, Matt? I think I should have set your joke up better. <laughs> <clears throat> this is why we have a script, Matt. <laughs> and this is why rehearsing is important. All right. Also, simple eighth grader reading skills. <laughs> Look, my mother was proud I read at a seventh grade level, okay? Get off my back. Look, no, you're definitely not going to be one of the strong who survive. I've watched you struggle to open a candy bar for an hour. Well, those Kinder Eggs are tough, mate. <laughs> In that case, I strongly oppose Elon Musk and everything he stands for, no matter how good he smells. All right, let's move on. What do we have next? Ah, yes. Your dog is judging you for being a jerk. It's true. <clears throat> According to a study recently published in the journal Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews, dogs can tell when someone is being a jerk, and they use that information when deciding how to interact with the humans around them. So for the studies, what the researchers did is they took owner, dogs and their owners, and then they had two researchers pretend to help the owner with a task. When the dog observed the researcher being a jerk, they actively and like, and uh, em emphatically for a dog, shun the researcher, proving that dogs can tell whether or not you're being a jerk. Send me this study, mate. I need to show my therapist. She said I was crazy for thinking my dog was judging me. Well, I don't know if it's like, that crazy. For like, what I was doing was I was trying to find the exact quantity of ice cream and red wine that I could mix, mix together while watching romantic comedies and crying. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he probably was. She, was. stupid bitch. <laughs> can, I don't th can you say that? It's a technical term. I think it only applies to dogs. Anyway. Look, I think it's really harsh to be, for dogs to judge us, am I right? Like, who's the asshole that ate all the garbage and knocked it over? Or the motherfucker took the last piece of bacon from the table? Yeah, and he pissed on my shoes the other day, too. What if I judge my dog for being a jerk? 
What I want, it makes you a terrible person. No. <laughs> what I want to know, though, is whether or not dogs experience mor morality the same way that humans do. Or is their sense of morality based on an unquestioning, undying devotion to the one who puts food in the bowl and takes you outside? This person must res represent God to the, to the dog, yeah? I think your ego is getting a bit out of hand, Matt. I think it's completely warranted. Anyway, so to find out whether or not dogs experience mor morality the same way as humans, we sent our head bitch correspondent, Hannah Becker, out into the field to gather responses from the dogs themselves. Hi, this is Hannah Becker, the head bitch correspondent from the Technically Funny News team. Uh, I'm here in Park de Ciutadella. Uh, we're gonna interview some bitches. Do you think that the, the study, do you think that it was a really well done study or do you think that, do you think that there are just too many variables? There's too many variables at play. <laughs> Martha, please tell me, how does it feel to be a dog and right? Wrong. Hey, Ryo, how do you feel about the Cat Lives Matter movement? <laughs> how you feel about the, the study? Do you think that it, it was a well done study or do you think the conclusions are, are completely unreasonable? You see he's presenting us with his, with his butt here. Um, I don't know if that says something about his feelings about the study or not, but... So is, is this guy like God to you? This guy over here? Yeah? So you're, you can't keep your eyes off of him. This is Matt Murtha with the world's largest chihuahua. Sir, tell me, how does it feel to be a dog? <laughs> are, are, you, are you Jewish too? <laughs> <laughs> Did you agree with the methodology used in the study? No, huh? These are some dumb, dumb dogs. Uh, where, where do you derive your morality from? Hi, I'm, I'm here with Gordo the dog. Um, he's, he's a little bit... Ooh, ooh. He's uh, getting in there. Okay. Uh, I'm here. I'm here with Gordo the dog, and I have some questions about uh, our study that we we are talking about this week. Uh, how do you feel about the results of the study, Gordo? How does it feel to be a dog? Are you a good dog or a bad dog? Um. Okay. Uno, dos, tres. Technically funny. Yeah. Let's give a round of applause for our head bitch correspondent Hannah, Hannah Becker. Thank you, Hannah. That was some excellent reporting. Sorry, I couldn't help more. All right, so that wraps up our comedy news and science. Let's now... <laughs> Please contain your enthusiasm. It's okay. I'd now like to welcome to the stage our, our guest for the evening, uh, Dr. Jonathan Calderon. Welcome. Hello. Hello. All right, so before we start talking about your uh, research, can you explain a little bit your background? Where were you born? Where were oh, you raised? I've been born around <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah, but, but I, I, I I've been born in Figueres. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I've been born in Figueres, but i just been born there. I, All right. The only thing. You didn't do anything else there? Nope. Are you Just, sure? Yeah. Seems remarkably suspicious how much you're denying mm, no. the things you've done in Figueras. Nope. If we went to Figueras, <laughs> which is a, pla a place I assume I'm pronouncing exactly correctly, what would we find yeah. out about you? Nothing. I don't believe you. Nothing, nothing. I All right, okay. so where did, you, where did you study? I studied at the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, which is uh, right in Bellaterra, on the outs Bang. outskirts of Barcelona. Is the like the rebel zone of yeah. Barcelona? And what did you study there? What? What did you study there? Ah, physics. Ah, okay. Physics. Yeah. Did you always find yourself drawn to science as a child? Uh, I was. I, I wanted first to be a, a computer scientist, 
and then someone convinced me into into physics, and it was a terrible mistake. Back you've been poor ever <laughs> since. <laughs> but they they tell you there were more girls in physics. <laughs> yeah, that was. But the the girls are in chemistry, not in physics, for oh, some reason. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why. Good chemistry there. Yeah, mm. chemistry is like the the thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah. you're here to tell, talk to us today about pet scanning. Right? Yeah. Think so. Is so, that like scanning your, your dogs and your cats? <laughs> <laughs> no, not like that. No, 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 no. All right. So here on the screen we have an image of like a, a representation of a PET scan. Can you tell us how this works a little bit? Yeah, I can try. So uh, a PET scan uh, uses uh, antimatter in order to make like a three-dimensional uh, image of how the uh, body is functioning. So. Uh, it uses, uh, what is antimatter first, maybe? I, I should explain that. So for every elementary particle, there is uh, another of, of matter, there is a partner, which is called the antimatter particle, uh, which is the same, but with uh, the sign of the charges interchange. For instance, uh, the electron that everybody knows and loves, <laughs> there is... It is the, my favorite. Yeah, everybody <laughs> loves electrons. So... so the anti-electron has a special name, it's called positron, and it's like the electron, but with positive uh, uh, electric charge. So what you do in a PET scan is uh, first you inject uh, in the body of the patient uh, sugar, but not any kind of sugar, a sugar in which one of the atoms of the sugar has been substituted by the radioactive uh, isotope. Usually uh, fluorine 18 is used for that. So I think that uh, this isotope has a half-life of like two hours and it needs to be produced. So it, you need to make it right, not in the spot, but during this day. And you need a, a little linear accelerator or a cyclotron to do that. And the, the name of the cyclotron is because we physicists, we love fancy names and tits. So... <laughs> Jonathan, can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. So in this Country. graph, I don't know if you can read this in the audience, yeah. but there's the word annihilation and then a big arrow towards a person's head. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> should we be worried about that? You should, you should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we'll come to, to, to the annihilation. The, it's, it is, I love this word, by the way, annihilation. Annihilation, yeah. Yeah. Kill You're them scaring all. me slightly, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should be scary, yeah. So, <laughs> so you inject this, this sugar into the, into the patient, and, and this F18 uh, disintegrates uh, through, a, through a, the K channel called Beta Plus, and I just give this information because we visit this with love fancy names mm -hmm. and tits. So... <laughs> Fact. I didn't say that. Okay. So, and... and this beta plus decays consists of uh, a proton inside the nuclei becomes a neutron, and in the process you emit a, a positron, which is the antiparticle of the of the electron, and a neutrino. So the neutrino goes away; he, nobody interacts with the neutrino. Yes, it's, it's like Matt Murtha at a party. No, <laughs> it's, it's it's like me with girls. I mean, they go there now. Just for the record, he beat me to that, all right? Yeah, did you see us <laughs> race to it? Actually, it's Christopher that's nobody interacting with. But the positron, the positron is the cool guy. This guy, it's the antiparticle of the electron, and every electron lady wants to make photons. <laughs> With a positron, everyone. So really, I'm kind of like a positron, yeah? Uh, I, I can judge, I can judge. <laughs> well, all right, here's my thinking. Yeah. So a positron, that's antimatter, right? Yeah. Is there such a thing as uncle matter, too? <laughs> and that electron. was wordplay, guys. You're meant to be an intelligent audience. Come on. I'll, sh I'll show you some wordplay. <laughs> all right, so a positron is antimatter. An electron is matter, yeah. and then I must be the matist. <laughs> all right, great. It's wordplay. Come <laughs> on, guys. I'm out of here. Yeah, all right. <laughs> no. no, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Back to the graph. Get yeah. the, the, my yeah. train of thought. Yeah. So you have this positron, and he travels a little bit, 
and, and he uh, interacts with an electron girl. And as usually happens between girls and guys, they annihilate each other. <laughs> so. All right. So if we go to the next slide, we see PET scans, I think. No. 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 <laughs> DJ charms. Get your music out of here. All right. Here we go. So what you're saying is that the positron, it, it races out of the uh, decaying nuclei, right? And it interacts with an electron, and then it creates this annihilation event. Yeah. And then as a result of the annihilation of the electron and the positron, gamma rays are in fact uh, produced, right? Yeah, they make two photons, and as the interaction happens almost at rest, because they are in bed, so mm -hmm. they go in a straight line, back to back. It's yeah. the technical term for that. So what you have is that uh, the patient begins to emit these high energy gamma rays that are just photons, high energy photons, but we call it gamma rays because we love fancy words, <laughs> and tits. So uh, you put this ring of detectors around the body and you uh, pick up these coincidence events, like one photon here, one photon here. And with this information and some mathematical magic, you can reconstruct how much sugar you have in every part of the body or the brain or the part you are scanning. And the sugar, the amount of sugar you have is proportional to the sugar consumption of the cells of this part of the body. So you, what you have is how much energy is these cells uh, using. So cancer cells, for instance, use more energy, and if you have something dead uh, in, in the brain or somewhere, you have less <laughs> energy. Yeah. In Christopher's brain. <laughs> so the amazing thing about this, though, is that you're using actual particle physics to be able to get a functional readout of how active these cells are in a, in a very precise way. Yeah, you know? all these uh, detectors are, has been developed for basic uh, fundamental research in particle physics. Yeah, true. So, ladies and gentlemen, those physics classes in high school, they were worth something after all. Really? He with oh no. <laughs> You're really loud. I think we found our next guest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why. <laughs> you think they know physics down there? Come on. All right. So, but this, this kind of brings us to uh, your research, right? Mm, yep. So, you were actually involved in creating better detectors. We tried, we tried, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, uh, the idea of, of, of the project was uh, to test, uh, it was a Pathfinder project uh, funded by the European Research Council uh, in order to uh, apply a different kind of detectors uh, based on semiconductor instead of, of the usual ones which are crystals. Uh, and this will improve the efficiency which will allow to lower the dose uh, in the patient or uh, make uh, more well, scans, yeah. which is what will happen, and, and have clear image because you have better image uh, energy resolution, so you can, uh, that there are some, noise. this is like the, the best case scenario, but of course a lot of things can happen. The uh, photon can interact before reaching the detector with another piece of the body and get scattered, so you want to reject these events in, in order to have a clear image. Yeah. Do you only capture, or is a way of filtering that only to take measurements that have a, a photon and a completely, I don't know if anti-parallel is the right word, or orthogonal? Yeah, I think it is. I would, I would go, yes, <laughs> anti-parallel is the correct word for but this. You can, all right, so a proper event, right, it will actually it will emit two gamma ray photons, and they should be traveling in a completely straight line. Yeah. And if it hits something and scatters, now it, it'll, there'll be an angle between the two. So can you filter... Your, your you results. can feel that using this, but you don't really know because you, given two points, you can always make a straight line. So you, you, can, you cannot know if these two events are scattered or not. The way to know is to measure the energy. The uh -huh. Because these gamma rays are, have a specific energy of 5, 11 uh, kilo electron volts. So what you do is to measure the energy, and if the, it doesn't match this, you throw the event. You toss it out. But these crystals, which are called scintillators, have a kind of poor 
energy resolution compared with the semiconductor technology. So I think on the next slide, we actually, I took some, some figures out of your yeah. paper. Uh, this was from a 2014 yes, paper he published in the Journal of Instruments, yeah. right? So <laughs> wait, you walk us through this you know, in really general terms. We have a diagram here of the, of the, this the is, photoreceptor on the left. A simulation of a prototype we are trying to build, actually, using, using actual technology that we have available, because for the project we need to, to build a special readout uh, chip, an ASIC, in order to read the, the detector channels, but the chip was not built. So we tried to use uh, actual technology uh, of another chip uh, which was available in the market in order to build this little prototype. Uh, so this uh, paper was about simulating what is the expected performance for, for this prototype. Um, for that we use the same kind of software which is used at CERN for the Higgs and this kind of cool things that they do in this place. Yeah. Sexier <laughs> science. <laughs> I feel like I understood a lot of those words. <laughs> yeah. This is where the cafe is. <laughs> this is the library. Yeah. Yeah. The, so, the Twin Towers before, you know, 9-11. <laughs> Too soon, Chris. One of them full. Yeah, right. This is them afterwards. So before we, we open, I, I want to take questions from the audience and then give our, our resident physicist a chance to, um, to comment. Well, no, but like, uh, yeah, you're on the spot now. If you're going to talk during the show, you got to share with the whole class. But no, this is good. It'll open up a dialogue about uh, particle physics. But how do so... What was the end result of your study? What is your evaluation of Compton gamma ray camera prototypes? So at the end, well, I've been talking about PET, and that was the main focus of the research group we have. This is what the group is funded. But uh, the detectors we develop can be used for many kind of, of different scanners. Uh, in my case, I was studying uh, uh, like a fringe scanner that was never built called Compton Camera. And, and the idea uh, on this paper is to see if with this we can build one of those that has never been used for medical imaging because the technology is not good enough uh, to make it uh, happen. So the results were, yeah, we probably can do that. It will be really expensive, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's somebody else's problem. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah that would, but there's a long way from a simulation paper to uh, the actual thing, and then the part of the project was uh, to actually uh, laboratory stuff, yeah. which I collaborate a little in this, and another part was pure simulation in the, in the computer using a farm of computers that was near to, to the institute. Okay. Fair. Well, I feel <laughs> fully informed. Yeah? Yeah. Really? Now, one last thing I want to address here. So you've, you've left science, is that correct? Yeah. What happened? Share your story, brother. You're wow. in a safe place. It's okay. <sighs> but this okay. is important because I don't think that people realize quite how stressful and difficult um, being an active researcher is. And the way that the industry or the field is structured it makes it very difficult for people to actually stay in science. Okay, so, so how much time I have to rant about research? You have two minutes. <laughs> okay. So disclaimer, this is my personal opinion. Uh, everything is subjective and blah, blah, blah. This is really only physics. My personal experience in the institute, I thought the people were educated from United States and Germany, so I think it's kind of representative. So that being said, have you seen an old TV show called Kung Fu? Kung Fu. Yeah. Yeah, with David Curran. Yeah, David Curran and I. In, in the beginning of each episode, they show how this guy go out of the Shaolin Temple. So he had to, there, there is a big cauldron of boiling stuff, and he has to pick it up with his wrist. Wrist, is it correct? Yeah, yeah. wrist. Yeah, and, and take it away. In the process, he get burned and get some dragon scars <laughs> who prove that he's a Shaolin monk. So, and, and what they, kind of lab were you in? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, let me, let me elaborate. So, uh, and afterwards he roams United States for some reason, I don't know who ended up in the United States, uh, using Kung Fu to solve problems. So this is research. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the PhD, you get this cauldron, you get burned and get the scars for all your life. <laughs> And Agreed. then, if you, if you are stupid enough to continue in this, this thing, then you roam the world like using Kung Fu from place to place. <laughs> Just lost, trying to make a way. Yeah, that's it. Dealing is. with the emotional and physical scars. Yeah, that's, it. that's research. <laughs> Science, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that's perfect timing. Um, we'll have to... I think maybe one day we'll, we'll make an episode just uh, for people that have left and are considering leaving science because I, th I think it's a good topic for everyone. But we don't have time tonight. Aww. I know. Yeah. But we do have time for questions from the audience. Does anybody, any, any physicist perhaps from Santiago <laughs> that might want to uh, share their right critiques? Over to you. I've already heard you talk a lot in this show. Come on. What were you saying? What were you thinking? Sorry, no, no, speaking English more. Yo puedo hablar español muy bueno. Eh? Sí. Vale, venga. Venga. Me pregunto yo, ¿qué tan verídico todo lo que has dicho? Porque me parece muy sofisticado. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm a sophisticated person. My, my grasp of the Spanish language isn't strong, but she said I looked great tonight, right? <laughs> I just right, Do you want to translate smart. the question and then answer in English? I, I, there was no question there. Oh, there was no question. All right, All right well, there we go. Thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> Spanish, Christopher. <laughs> Jesus. I only know C. Fergus. All right, hang on, Fergus. I'm coming over to you. Uh, so I'm not so keen on the idea of having these gamma rays flying out of my brain. So what can you do to tell me to, to try the PET scan rather than... Why can't we use um, magnetic resonance imaging? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So the, the, dif the difference between MRI... You can do some tricks with MRI to get some idea of how the body... Of the physiology, how the body is functioning. What, but for real, with MRI or CT scans, what you get is an image of the, of the densities in the body, so the structures you get. This is the bone, this is the, la the, uh, the lung, this is the dick, so the important <laughs> structures, you get, you get them. I didn't see that on my MRI scan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. So, but with a PET, what you get is, uh, is how the body is functioning. It's different information. So, in fact, what you do usually is to combine both. And one of the, the perks of the research we're doing is that you can safely put our PET scan inside an MRI and it will work, it, it will work fine because you sh the, the other ones will get affected by the magnetic field of the MRI. So you can take a PET scan simultaneously with an MRI? With an MRI. And that's a good, you need to do this kind of things to, for the something called attenuation correction. That is that, uh, of course, the, the... Yeah, I see it right there. Yeah, <laughs> the previous slide. So if, if a gamma ray is, is deep inside the body, it has to go through more tissue. Ah, okay. So the pens, the, what you get when you do the image is that you get artificially more gammas from the, from the outside of the body that from the inside, so you have to correct for that. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. No, I did actually understand that. Yeah. Good. Any, Any other questions? Yeah. All right, no more questions. Maybe one in the Wait, back. Hang on, you, but you have to come forward a little bit then. No, not him, not him. Come on. I don't know if I can make it this far, mate. Him. Yeah, what's, what's that shit on your T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Jonathan is wearing yeah. uh, some strange I'm, language. I had to wear today the physicist nerd uniform. I'm nerd in many different ways. So this is a part of the standard model of particle physics. So this is essentially a piece of how everything works. So, and it's, it's very clear, you can see. This is electromagnetism. This is uh, Look, you have all the leptons. women talking. You have here, what? Nothing. 
you have here the coupling between mother and, and the Higgs, and the, this is the Higgs. It's clear, you, can you see? It's, it's clear. Does that answer your it's question, clear. John? <laughs> okay. All right, so with that, though, we have to wrap up our, our interview with uh, Dr. Calderon, but I would like to finish by playing our favorite game, a little bit of a tradition here at Technically Funny Science Talk Show, and it is called Fuck, Mary Kill. Hmm, interesting. So we have here three women famous for their contributions to particle physics. Of course, Madame Curie. Yes, who basically invented radiation, as I understand it. Yeah. Then we have the less known Harriet Brooks. She was the first com Canadian female nuclear physicist. Um, she actually discovered radon and tried to characterize its molecular mass. And then lastly, we have Vera. And a name that I only imagine sounds like a <laughs> <laughs> She's a current so. MIT professor and daughter of one of the principal Manhattan Project engineers. So, so how this thing works? I have to. So you have to decide which of these fine ladies you would fuck, who you would marry, and whom you would kill. So I have to kill one of them. I have moral yes. issues with this. Because at my current situation, I cannot be picky with, <laughs> with the girls. So, I don't think so. So threesome is not an, is not an option? I think that's a foursome, my friend. But I can as still, long as one of them is dead. <laughs> I can still fuck the one I kill? Yeah. Okay. So... But not the one you marry. All right, we won't ask what you do before <laughs> the, you kill them. So I will have an affair with Marie Curie for sure because I think she will glow in the dark. <laughs> so for sure, that is like a goosey luth. Google that. Uh, so I will f fuck Marie Curie, maybe. I will kill Harriet Brooks. <laughs> I'm fucker. Kill those Canadians, yeah. And I will marry Vera for sure. Yeah. She was a fox. A fox? Or maybe that's just science hot. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Please give a, a warm round of applause for our guest tonight. Thank you. That's all the time we have for tonight's science talk show. I'd like to thank everybody that's a part of the Technically Funny team. DJ Charms. Our bitch correspondent, Hannah Becker. Often co-host, my beautiful co-host for the evening, Christopher Drifter. There he is. And of course, myself. A big round of applause for Matthew Murtha. Yes, yes. You did Thank very you. good reading today. Thank you very, yes. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back with the Comedy Lab. We're going to have a comedy game show and stand-up comics from Barcelona. Stick around, buy some beers, have fun. Thank you very much. Let them talk, 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 let them talk